The BBC presents The Sign of Four, a Sherlock Holmes story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, dramatized as a serial in five parts by Felix Felton. Episode one, The Science of Deduction. Good day. My name is Dr. Watson. I well remember that afternoon in 1888 when my friend Sherlock Holmes and I became engaged on the case we were afterwards to call the Sign of Four. We had had a good luncheon, at least I'd enjoyed it, but Holmes was listless and irritable throughout the meal. His long, nervous fingers beat a restless tattoo on the table as I tried to distract him with stories of my Afghan campaign. Later, when we returned to our Baker Street rooms, he started to fill his briar root pipe, then laid it aside, unlit, and picking up a monograph on Etruscan pottery, glanced idly through the pages. Finally, he put this aside, too, and took his violin from its case. is it, my dear fellow? Not your old craving again, I trust. No, Watson, no. It's just that my mind rebels at stagnation. Give me problems, give me work. The most abstruse cryptogram or the most intricate analysis and I'm in my own proper sphere. I crave for mental exaltation. That's why I've chosen my own particular profession or rather created it. I'm the only one in the world. The only unofficial detective? The only unofficial consulting detective. I am the last and highest court of appeal. How do you mean? When Gregson or Lestrade or Athelney Jones are out of their depth, which, by the way, is their normal state, <laughs> quite, then the matter is laid before me. I examine the data as an expert and pronounce a specialist's opinion. And claim no credit. The work itself, the pleasure of finding a field for my peculiar powers, that's my reward. You remember my methods of work in the Jefferson Hope case? Indeed, yes. I even embodied them in a small brochure with the somewhat fantastic title of A Study in Scott. Yes, I glanced through it. Honestly, I can't congratulate you on it. Oh? May I ask what's wrong with it? Detection is, or ought to be, an exact science. And it should be treated in the same cold and unemotional manner. You mean I've rather tinged it with, um, romanticism? Exactly. I must confess I was annoyed at this criticism of a work which had been designed specially to please him. More than once during the years I'd lived with him in Baker Street, I had observed that a small vanity underlay my companion's quiet and didactic manner. I made no remark, however, but sat nursing my wounded leg. I'd had a Giselle bullet through it some time before, and though it did not prevent me from walking, it ached wearily at every change of the weather. After a while, Holmes picked up his pipe again and lit it. Here's a pleasant letter I I had this morning. Oh, who from? The French detective, Francois Lavillard. I was able to help him in a little matter recently by referring him to a parallel case in Riga in 1857 and another in St. Louis in 1871. Have a look at it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Magnifique. Mm-hmm. Tour de force. <laughs> Why, he writes like a pupil to his master. Oh, he rates my assistance too highly. He has considerable gifts himself. He has the power of observation. He has the power of deduction. All he lacks is knowledge, and that may come in time. He's translating my small works into French. Your work? Oh, (laughs) didn't you know? I've been guilty of several monographs on technical subjects. Here's one of them, upon the distinction between the ashes of the various tobaccos. Oh, and, and how many different kinds are there, then? I enumerate 140. 140? Indeed, yes. Sometimes it's a point of supreme importance. For example, if you can say definitely that a murder has been done by a man who was smoking an Indian lunka, it obviously narrows your field of search. Yes, 
I suppose it does. To the trained mind, there's as much difference between the black ash of a trichinopoly and the white fluff of bird's eye as there is between a cabbage and a potato. You know, Holmes, you really have an extraordinary genius for minutiae. I appreciate their importance. But I weary you with my hobby. Oh, not in the least. But particularly since I've been able to watch the practical application. But there is one thing. Yes? You were speaking just now about observation and deduction. Well, surely one implies the other, doesn't it? Oh, hardly. For example, observation shows me that you've been to the Wigmore Street Post Office this morning. What? But deduction lets me know that when you were there, you dispatched a telegram. Good heavens. Am I right? Oh, absolutely right on all points. But for the life <laughs> of me, I don't see how you arrived at it. My dear Watson... It's so absurdly simple that an explanation is superfluous. I can assure you it's not. Oh. Well, then. Observation tells me that you have a little reddish mold adhering to your instep. Oh, have I? <laughs> yes, so I have, but... Uh... Just opposite the Wigmore Street office, they've taken up the pavement and thrown up some earth. It's difficult to avoid as you go in. The earth is of this peculiar reddish tint, which, as far as I know, is not found anywhere else in the neighbourhood. So much is observation... The rest is deduction. All right, then. How did you deduce the telegram? Well, first, I knew you hadn't written a letter. I've been sitting opposite you all the morning. I can see stamps and postcards over there on your desk. Mm -hmm. So what else could you have gone to the post office for but to send a wire? Eliminate all other factors, and the one which remains must be the truth. Yes, as you say, it is quite simple when you see it. Would you think me impertinent if I put your theories to a rather more severe test? On the contrary. What is your problem? Uh, here is a watch that has recently come into my possession. Would you have the kindness to let me have your opinion on the character or habits of the late owner? May I have it? Thank you. Hmm. May I open the back? Of course. Pass me the convex lens, will you? Mm. Thank you. Yes. Hmm. There are hardly any data. The watch has recently been cleaned, which robs me of my most suggestive facts. You're right. It was clean before it was sent on to me. All the same, my research hasn't been entirely barren. I should say that the watch belonged to your elder brother, who inherited it from your father. I suppose you gathered that from the letters H.W. on the back. Quite so. The W suggests your name. The date of the watch is 50 years back, and the initials are as old as the watch. So it was made for the last generation. Jury usually descends to the eldest son. And if I remember right, your father has been dead for many years. So it's been in the hands of your eldest brother. Right so far. Anything else? He was a man of untidy habits and careless. He was left with good prospects, but he threw away his chances. Lived for some time in poverty with occasional short intervals of prosperity, and finally took to drink and died. That's all I can gather. Holmes, that's unworthy of you. My dear fellow, what do you mean? I could never have believed that you'd descend to this. Descend to what? You've made inquiries about my unhappy brother, and now you pretend to read it all from his own watch. Why, it's unkind. And, to speak plainly, it has a touch of charlatanism about it. Oh, my dear doctor, pray accept my apologies. I do assure you I never even knew you had a brother until you handed me that watch. Then how in the name of all that's wonderful did you get these facts? They're all absolutely true. Ah, that's good luck. I could only say what was the balance of probability. I didn't expect to be as accurate as that. Well, it all seems very strange to me. Only because you don't observe the small facts upon which large inferences depend. For example, I began by saying your brother was careless. Yes. Yeah. How did you find that out? Look at the lower part of the watch case. It's dented in two places and cut and marked all over. Oh, so it is. He obviously kept other hard objects, such as coins and keys, in the same pocket. Surely it's no great feat to assume that any man who treats a 50-guinea watch like that must be a careless man. Uh, it's also fair to infer that a man who inherits a watch like that is pretty well provided for in other respects. Well... Where's the evidence of his, um, decline? It's very customary for pawnbrokers in England, when they take a watch, to scratch the number of the ticket with a pinpoint on the inside of the case. My lens shows four such numbers inside the case. Inference that your brother was often in low water 
with occasional bursts of prosperity when he was able to redeem the pledge. I see. And the drinking? Look at the inner plate, where the keyhole is. What sober man's key could have scored those grooves? But you'll never find a drunkard's watch without them. He winds his watch at night and leaves these traces of his unsteady hand. Well, where's the mystery in all this? It's as clear as daylight. Oh, Holmes, I regret my injustice. I should have had more faith in you. Oh, my dear fellow. Mm. May I ask um, whether you have any professional inquiry on foot at the moment? Nothing, hence my exasperation. I cannot live without brain work. What else is there to live for? Come over here to the window, Watson. Look at the yellow fog and the drab, dismal houses. What could be more hopelessly prosaic and material? What is the use of having powers when one has no field on which to exert them? Come in. Yes? Excuse me, sir, but there's a young lady for you. A young lady? Yes, sir. She sent up a card. Thank you. Miss Mary Morstan. Hmm, I have no recollection of the name. Ask the young lady to step up, Mrs. Hudson. Very good, sir. Well, perhaps you'd like me to... No, no, but... don't go, Doctor. I prefer you to remain. In a moment, there was a step on the stair, and Miss Morstan entered the room. She was a blonde young lady, small, dainty, well-gloved, and dressed in the most perfect taste. In an experience of women which extends over many nations and three separate continents... I have never looked upon a face which gave a clearer promise of a refined and sensitive nature. As she took the seat which Sherlock Holmes placed for her, her hand quivered and her lip trembled. Mr. Holmes, you once gave some help to my employer, Mrs. Cecil Forrester. That's why I've come to you. Mrs. Cecil Forrester. I believe I was of some slight service to her. As far as I remember, the case was a very simple one. Oh, she didn't think so. Anyway, you can't say the same of mine. Indeed? Truly, I can't think of anything more strange than the situation I find myself in. It's utterly impossible to explain. Ah, state your case. I say, I, I really do feel I ought not to be here, if you'll excuse me. Oh, no, please. Mr. Holmes, if your friend would be good enough to stop, he might be of inestimable service to us. Oh, well, if that's really your wish, of course I... Uh, well, thank you. Now, Miss Marston... Well, briefly, the facts are these. My father was an officer in an Indian regiment. Oh, really? Yes, and he sent me home when I was quite a child. My mother was dead and I had no relative in England, so I was placed in a boarding school at Edinburgh and stayed there till I was 17. Then my father got 12 months' leave and came home. How long ago was this, Miss Morstan? Nearly 10 years. 10 years? My father telegraphed to me from London that he'd arrived safely and told me to come down at once. He was staying at the Langham Hotel. So you came to London? Yes, and drove to the Langham. And there I was informed that Captain Morstan was staying there, but that he'd gone out the night before and not returned. I, I waited all day, but there was no news of him. So that night I went to the manager of the hotel... He put me in touch with the police, and next morning we advertised in all the papers. With what result? None. From that day to this, no word has ever been heard of my unfortunate father. You me. He came home with his heart full of hope to find some peace, some comfort. A and instead... I... Oh, Miss Morstan. Uh, the date? He disappeared on the 3rd of December, 1878... Oh, nearly ten years ago, as I say. His luggage? It stayed at the hotel. Was there anything in it to suggest any clue? No. Some books, some clothes, and a number of curiosities from the Andaman Islands. The Andaman Islands? Yes. He'd been one of the officers in charge of the convict guard there. Had he any friends in town? Only one that we know of. Major Sholto of his own regiment. Oh, which regiment was it, Miss Morstan? The 34th Bombay Infantry. Ah. The Major had retired some little time before and lived at Upper Norwood. We communicated with him, of course, but he didn't know that his brother officer was in England. A singular case. Oh, but I, I haven't yet told you the most singular part of it. Pray do, then. About six years ago, an advertisement appeared in the Times asking for the address of Miss Mary Morstan and saying it would be to her advantage to come forward. There was no name or address. Have you the exact date? Yes, the 4th of May, 1882. Thank you. 
At that time, I had just entered Mrs. Forrester's family as a governess, and she advised me to publish my address in the advertisement column. Mr. Holmes, the same day, a small cardboard box was sent to me through the post, and inside was a large and lustrous pearl. With no message? Nothing. And since then, every year on the same date, a similar box has arrived containing a similar pearl with no clue where it has come from. Have you had these pearls examined? Oh, I have indeed. An expert says they're of a very rare variety and very valuable. They're certainly very handsome. You can see them for yourselves. I've brought them with me. Well, I must say, upon my word, those are some of the finest pearls I've ever seen. Thank you. Your statement is most interesting, Miss Morstan. Tell me, has anything else occurred to you? Yes. It happened today. That's why I've come to you. What happened? This letter arrived this morning. Perhaps you'd like to read it for yourself. Thank you. The envelope, too, please. Postmark London, Southwest. Date, November the 7th. Hmm. Man's thumb mark on the corner. Probably the postman. Best quality paper. Envelopes at sixpence a packet. Particular man in his stationery. No address. Well, what does it say, Holmes? It says, Be at the third pillar from the left outside the Lyceum Theatre tonight at seven o'clock. If you are distrustful, bring two friends. You are a wronged woman and shall have justice. Do not bring the police. If you do, all will be in vain. Your unknown friend... Well, really, this is a very pretty little mystery. What do you intend to do, Miss Morstan? That is exactly what I want to ask you. Then we shall most certainly go. You and I and... <clears throat> Why, yes, Dr. Watson's the very man. Your correspondent said two friends. He and I have worked together before. But would he come? Madam, I shall be proud and happy if I could be of any service. You are both very kind. I have led a retired life and have no friends to appeal to. If I'm here at six, it will do, I suppose. You mustn't be later. There is one other point, though. Is the handwriting of this letter the same as that on the pearl box addresses? I have them all here. You can compare them. You really are a model client. She is, indeed. You have the correct intuition. Let us see now. Hmm. Yes, they're disguised hands, except the letter... But there's no question who wrote them. Look how that irrepressible Greek E breaks out. Look at the twirl of the final S. They're undoubtedly by the same person. I shouldn't like to suggest false hopes, Miss Morstan, but is there any resemblance between this hand and your father's? Nothing could be more unlike it. I expected to hear you say so. We'll expect you then at six. Pray let me keep the papers. Of course. I may look into the matter before then. It's only half past three. Au revoir, then. Au revoir. Au revoir, Dr. Watson. Well, goodbye till six o'clock. My word, what a very attractive woman. Is she? I didn't observe. Really, Holmes, there's something positively inhuman in you at times. It is of the first importance not to let your judgment be biased by personal qualities. A client to me is a mere unit, a factor in a problem. So I see. The emotional qualities are antagonistic to clear reasoning. I assure you that the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money. But in this case... I, I never make exceptions. They disprove the rule. Um, what do you make of this fellow's handwriting? Hmm? It's legible and regular. I see him as a man of business habits and some force of character. Oh, no, Watson, no, that won't do. Look at his long letters. They hardly rise above the common herd. That D might be an e A. And that L might be an E. Well, what does that tell you? Men of character may write illegibly, but they always differentiate their long letters. And look at his K's. There's vacillation there, and self-esteem in his capitals. I'm going out now. Uh, am I to come with no, you? No, pray don't bother. I just have a few references to make. Uh, let me recommend this book. One of the most remarkable ever penned. It's Winwood Reed's Martyrdom of Man. I shall be back in an hour. I sat at the window with the volume in my hand. My thoughts ran upon our late visitor. Her smiles. 
her voice, and the strange mystery which overhung her life. If she was 17 at the time of her father's disappearance, she must be 7 and 20 now. A sweet age, when youth has become a little sobered by experience. So I mused, until such dangerous thoughts came into my head that I hurried away to my desk and plunged furiously into the latest treatise on pathology. What was I? an army surgeon with a weak leg and a weaker banking account that I should dare to think of such things. Well, Watson. Hello. How did you get off? Splendidly. There's no great mystery in this matter. A cup of tea. Thank you. The facts appear to admit of only one explanation. What? You've solved it already. Well, that would be to say too much. I've discovered a suggestive fact, that is all. What is it? I've just found from the back files of the Times that Major Shalto of Upper Norwood, late of the 34th Bombay Infantry, died on the 28th of April, 1882. I may be very obtuse, Holmes, but I fail to see what that suggests. Mm. No? Mm. You surprise me. Look at it this way, then. Captain Morstan disappears. The only person in London he could have visited is Major Shalto. Major Shalto denies having heard that he was in London. Four years later, Shalto dies. Well... Within a week of his death, Captain Morstan's daughter receives a valuable present, which is repeated from year to year, and now culminates in a letter which describes her as a wrong woman. Do you begin to see it? Yes, I think I do. What wrong can the letter refer to except this deprivation of her father? And why should the presence begin immediately after Shalto's death, unless Shalto's heir knows something of the mystery and wishes to make compensation? Have you any alternative theory which will meet the facts? No. But why should he write a letter now rather than six years ago? Again, the letter speaks of justice. Well, what justice can she have now? It's too much to suppose that her father's still alive. Mm, there are certainly difficulties, but our expedition of tonight will solve them all. Ah, here's a four-wheeler and Miss Morstan inside, no doubt. Are you ready? Yes. I should bring your heavy stick... And I shall take my revolver. Oh, you think our night's work may be as serious as that? For all we know. Come along, we'd better go down. It's a little past the hour. Miss Morstan was muffled in a dark cloak, and her sensitive face was composed but pale. She must have been more than woman if she did not feel some uneasiness at our strange enterprise. But her self-control was perfect, and she readily answered the few additional questions that Holmes put to her. Oh, yes, Major Shalto was a very particular friend of Papa's. He and Papa were in command of the troops in the Andaman Islands, so they were thrown together a great deal. I see. By the way, a curious paper was found in Papa's desk which no one could understand. A paper? Yes. I've brought it with me, in case you care to see it. I should indeed. Hold this pocket lantern for me, Watson. Mm. Ah. Sit. Now. Hmm. It's a paper of native Indian manufacture. At some time it has been pinned to a wall. It's some sort of diagram, surely. Yes. Yes, it seems to be the plan of part of some large building with halls and corridors and passages. There's a small cross in red ink there. And something in pencil just above it. Uh, let's have the lantern a bit closer. Hmm. Yes. It says 3.37 from left. Whatever that means. Oh, what's that hieroglyphic affair in the left-hand corner? Ah, yes. Four crosses in a line with their arms touching. And look what's written beside it. The sign of the four. Jonathan Small, Mohammed Singh, Abdullah Khan, Dost Akbar. I really don't see how this bit of paper bears on the matter. No, nor do I. Yet it's obviously a document of importance. It's been carefully kept in a pocketbook, one side as clean as the other. It was in his pocketbook when we found it. Keep it carefully, Miss Morstan. It may prove of use to us. I begin to suspect that this matter may turn out to be much deeper and more subtle than I thought. I must reconsider my ideas. The day had been a dreary one, and a dense, drizzly fog lay low on the great city. 
Down the strand, the yellow glare from the shop windows threw a murky, shifting radiance across the crowded thoroughfare. There was, to my mind, something eerie and ghost-like in the endless procession of faces which flitted across these narrow bars of light and back into the gloom once more. Here's the Lyceum. What a time our friend has chosen for the rendezvous. Everyone's just arrived into the theatre. Make for the third pillar, driver. Do me best, sir. Look at the chef fronts and the dams. Well, who knows? We may be in for a more exciting evening than they are. This do, sir? Yes. Excuse me, sir. Are you the parties who come with Miss Morstan? I am Miss Morstan, and these two gentlemen are my friends. You will pardon me, miss. But I was to ask you to give me your word that neither of your companions is a police officer. I give you my word. All right, then. See that cab the boy's leading over? I'll ask you to leave this one and go over to that one. Then I'll drive you myself. May we know where we're going? I'm afraid not, sir. Very well. Watson, help Miss Morstan across. I'll pay our cabman off and join you. We had hardly taken our places in the second four-wheeler before the man who had addressed us mounted to his box, whipped up his horse, and we were plunging away at a furious pace through the crowded street. We were driving to an unknown place on an unknown errand. And what with our pace and the fog and my own limited knowledge of London, I'd soon lost my bearings. Any idea where we are, Holmes? I know exactly. We've come by Rochester Row and Vincent Square. Now we're in the Vauxhall Bridge Road. We're making for the Surrey side, apparently. Yes, I thought so. Now we're on the bridge. We did indeed get a fleeting view of the stretch of the Thames, with the lamp shining on the broad, silent river. But our cab dashed on and was soon involved in a labyrinth of streets on the other side. Wandsworth Road, Priory Road, Stockwell Place, Cold Harbour Lane. Our quest doesn't appear to take us into very fashionable regions. Holmes, do you think this may all be part of some ridiculous hoax? No, I do not. People don't send valuable pearls as a joke, and whoever invited us on this errand sent Miss Morstan those pearls. There's one thing puzzling me particularly, Watson. What's that? Our driver's face. I've seen it somewhere, but I can't place it. Mm, I'm afraid it doesn't mean anything to me. How are you feeling, Miss Morstan? I can't say I care for this neighborhood. <laughs> I quite agree. It's forbidding in the extreme, eh, Holmes? It is indeed. Little wonder that crime breeds in this murk and squalor. Then came rows of two-storied villas, each with a frontage of miniature garden. And then again interminable lines of new staring brick buildings, the monster tentacles that the giant city was throwing out into the country. Until at last, the cab drew up at the third house in the terrace. We're there, Miss Morstan. Will you and your friends step out, please? Ah, certainly. Uh, take my hand, Miss Morstan. Thank you. Holmes, don't bother, my dear fellow. All these houses look uninhabited. Not this one. At least there's a glimmer of light in the kitchen window. Oh, he's there, sir. Chafing he'll be, though I'll come as quick as I could. Will you please to follow me? The coachman guided us with his lantern to the front door. On our knocking, the door was instantly thrown open, showing the dim, sordid hallway that the outside of the house suggested. But standing there to receive us was a strangely incongruous figure. A tall Hindu servant in a yellow turban, white loose-fitting clothes, and a yellow sash. Miss Morstan? I am Miss Morstan, and these are my friends. The Saib awaits you. I will warn him of your arrival. That ends the first episode of The Sign of Four by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, adapted for broadcasting by Felix Felton, with Richard Herndl as Sherlock Holmes and Brian Coleman as Watson. Production for the BBC by Archie Campbell. <laughs>